Hello and welcome to another episode of Craft D&D. Today we are going to roll up a character. We're going to create a elven wizard. <laughs> reason I chose a elf wizard is because, well, quite frankly, Barbarian wasn't available and they don't have the feats listed in the basic rules, which is what I wanted to roll this up from. Otherwise, I was actually going to do a human, uh, a variant human Barbarian, but since those rules are not available in the basic rules, I decided to go with Elven Wizard instead, doing a High Elf Wizard. To create this character, I'm going to be using the D&D &D basic rules that you can download from the Wizards of the Coast website. These are full rules. Um, they are limited in as far as the amount of rules that they include in them. Like, for example, what I said to, be in, to begin with, I wanted to create a barbarian human variant. Um, the Barbarian's not in here, the Human Variant is in here, but the feats are not. So you're kind of limited on some of the choices you can make, but the rules themselves are the complete rules, or just a subset of the complete rules, but they are the complete official rules, the ones that are here, and the rules that are here and the entries that are here match the Player's Handbook that you can purchase uh, pretty much word for word. Um, there, there probably are some differences. But for the most part, they're going to match up pretty completely. If you're looking to just get started and to roll up some basic characters and get playing it the first time. Maybe you want to go play Adventurers League. Maybe you've been invited to play with somebody and want to come to the table with a character ready to go. These rules will help you to create a basic character that you can play at the table. They will be legal for Adventurers League. They'll be legal for play at almost any table that you go to, because these are the basic, basic rules that would apply to any Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition game. And once again, these rules are downloadable from DungeonsAndDragons.com, from the Wizards of the Coast website. Uh, you can get these rules, you can get character sheets, and you can get the Dungeon Master's Guide, which uh, is pretty much just a bunch of monsters in the Dungeon Master's Guide. But those three books together, or those three documents together, if you were to go download all of those for free from DungeonsAndDragons.com or the Wizards of the Coast uh, website, that's, and these are legal downloads, you can go ahead and get those uh, from the authors, and they will get you started uh, playing Dungeons and & Dragons, and it won't cost you any money at all. Of course, after you get started, you'll want to buy all the books, and then you'll spend all kinds of money. But to get started, it's... Uh, perfect, completely free. The nice thing about the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons is it was play tested by fans before they ever came out with the official rules or any rules like this even. Um, they came out with sections of rules, sent them out to the fans, fans tried them out, and then filled out surveys and gave feedback as far as what was liked, what was not liked, and the fans filled out surveys and the Rules were tweaked and changed based upon fan feedback. So many, many, 175,000 fans of D&D participated. I know I did. It was uh, pretty fun to see some of the original and earlier ideas of what they wanted to do. And then, obviously, they developed those rules based upon the feedback of all of the fans. So it was a lot of fun to get to participate in that playtest. When you first open up the document, you'll see the introduction, you know, base and basic introduction type stuff, and then they get right into the meat of it, creating a character and step-by-step -step characters. And what they do in that section is actually to walk you through creating a mountain dwarf fighter, uh, which is why I decided to go a different direction um, with the uh, wizard, with the high elf wizard, simply because I did not want to completely reproduce something you can already read in the book. So after you watch this video and have this document, you'll actually be able to create both a fighter and a wizard and probably the other two options that are listed. They also have the rogue and the cleric in here as well. Other classes that would be in the player's handbook would are the barbarian, the so, sorcerer, the warlock, uh, those would be other ones that are not included in the basic 
uh, rules here. As far as races, you can play a dwarf, an elf, a halfling, or a human. Uh, most notably missing, you're missing the gnome, you're missing the half orc, you're missing the tiefling. Uh, those are other char character races that can be played, uh, and they are all in the player's handbook. I want to take a moment now and just jump over to the character sheet, and this is the basic form fillable character sheet that's downloadable from the Wizards of the Coast website. Nice thing about this character sheet is you can click into the various boxes, type in the various boxes, and then if you have a more up-to-date version of Acrobat Reader, Adobe Acrobat Reader, you can actually save your character sheet as a digital format. You don't actually have to print it, although it is definitely handy at times having a printed copy at the table, but you don't have to if you prefer to play out but on a tablet or a smartphone or something. I've done both ways. I've I've tried. Uh, I've uh, used paper copies for a long time. I've tried a few different methods of having a digital copy, including this one. It works. It's fine. I kind of prefer paper, but that's just a personal preference. When filling out this character sheet, obviously you're going to start with your character name. Now your character name can really be anything. The the, uh, this document, and the Player's Handbook, and Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and some other documents, and lots and lots of websites out there have tons and tons of names out there. It doesn't really matter what you call your character. It's just something that you're gonna, you know, you'll be known by, like you know, your own personal name. Uh, usually, with your character, you might pick something out of uh, fantasy or science fiction or drama. Or you could totally make up a bunch of uh, letters, just put them together, that becomes your name as long as it's somehow pronounceable. Uh, you could use any of the uh, aforementioned options to just pick out a pre-generated name for you. I'm just going to pick out a basic name here. I'm just going to go with Sam the Elf. It's not very creative, it's not very original, but it is uh, it is something you can do. You could do something as simple as Sam the Elf, or you could have went to Lord of the Rings and grabbed an elf out of there, or... You know, anything like that that you wanted to do. So some things I can fill in right away. I know he's going to, his class is going to be wizard. He's going to be level one because we're just starting him. I could put uh, his background in, in here if I knew what his background was yet, but I haven't went and picked that out yet. Have a feeling it's going to be noble, but it might not be. You can put your name in there. That's handy if your character sheet gets lost at the table. He's going to be a high elf. Uh, he'll probably be chaotic good. Chaotic, there's lawful, there's neutral, and there's chaotic. Lawful, he follows the rules all of the time. Neutral, eh, kind of go either way with the rules. And chaotic, he kind of makes up his own rules as he goes along. And then there's the concept of uh, good, neutral, evil. Either you're you're good at heart, you you know you're a good person, you mean well. Um, the neutral, you don't really have, you're not necessarily good, you're not necessarily bad, you're just kind of in there in the middle, and of course evil would be, you're pretty self-centered, you're pretty selfish, it's all about what you want. So him being chaotic good, is it's, he's good at heart, but he does have a tendency to kind of break things as he goes along, maybe without even meaning to, or even realizing that he's hurting people when he hurts them, so... Experience points right now are at zero because we're just starting out. Other things on the character sheet include the strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. And we'll discuss all those more in a little bit, but those help you fill out the boxes next door, like the saving throws box and the skills box. Those will all get filled out based upon what you put in these boxes over here. Uh, your proficiency bonus, a first level character's proficiency is always going to be plus two. He hasn't played yet, so he has not been awarded any inspiration. Uh, here's where he'll put his armor class, his initiative, his speed, his maximum hit points, or how many times he can be hit before he goes down. Uh, there's some personality stuff over here, his ideals, his bonds, his flaws. His weapons and his uh, spell casting and probably will be more what was put over here for him. There was a fighter. It's where his sword would go. For a wizard, his favorite cantrip might go over here. Or even like his his dagger or his uh, staff or something like that could, could go over here as well. Some darts. 
And then there's other proficiencies, language, passer perception, any equipment he might be carrying, any treasure he might have. And then finally, features and traits, which can pretty much any of your class features or any of his extra abilities like spellcasting and things like that that he gets. Um, there is a spe separate spellcasting sheet that you can definitely fill out, or you could, in, for like a first level character, just put the spellcasting stuff in the features and traits section as well. Totally up to you as, as a uh, player. Now, since he is a wizard, and he'll probably have lots of spells over time in his spell book, I would go ahead and just use the spellcasting sheet. It's another optional sheet that's available on the same spot that you downloaded the main character sheet. You can also download the spellcasting sheet. A spellcasting class will be wizard. Now, if this was a multi-class uh, character, meaning that he had more than one class, maybe he's a wizard, but he later also becomes a cleric for some reason, that he might have two different spellcasting sheets, in which case you would want to keep those separate. So you'd have your wizard spellcasting sheet and your cleric spellcasting sheet, and just you would just want to keep those separate just, just to make things easy on yourself. Now back to the rules document. I'm going to look at some elven traits here. And these are your Character has a variety of natural abilities, the results of a thousand years of elven refinement. Uh, one thing that all elves get is an increase to their dexterity score by a plus two. Um, elves can be lived to be quite old, between 100 and 750 years of age. Elves uh, generally love freedom, variety, and self-expression, uh, so they're often good. So that's why I went ahead and chose good. That doesn't mean your elf has to be good. You could have a neutral elf. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, elves do tend towards being good. Uh, elves are about five to six feet tall and have slender builds. Um, their speed is 30 feet. So we can go ahead and go back over here to the character sheet and put 30 in here for the speed. So for 30 feet. Uh, Elves do have dark vision. They're accustomed to twilight force and the night sky. So this is something I probably would want to have on my character sheet so they can see what dark vision is and how that would apply in game. So they can see 60 feet as if it were bright light and in darkness as if it were dim light. Um, you can't discern color in darkness, only shades of gray, but you can't, you will see that goblin that's hiding in the darkness. So I would just come over here to my Features and Traits box and just put that information right in there. I probably wouldn't have all of this information because this is a quick reference for, for me at the table. So I probably would go Dark Vision, see in dim light, 60 feet as if it were bright, and in darkness as if it were dim. And I may have the bit about the color in there, or I might not. I probably wouldn't necessarily care. Um, but there are times maybe where you're, you know, you're trying to, know, you need to know what color something is, and if it's darkness, you can't tell if it's the red statue or the blue statue. You can just see that it's a statue and it's a shade of gray. So that could be important during gameplay. Now we know we have proficiency with the perception skill because of keen sense. Once again, I'll come over to the character sheet to find the perception skill. And I'm going to put a, just a check mark right there to remind myself when we get that far about perception. And while I'm also over here, I'm going to put a 2 in dexterity for now, just so I know and just so I remember to add that in when we go ahead and get our ability scores, which will be coming up here in a minute. It says I have Fey Ancestry. I have advantage on saving throws against being charmed and magic cannot put you to sleep. Well, this could be very important during gameplay, so I'm going to go ahead and make sure that's on my character sheet. So I would just come over here once again to those features and traits and go ahead and put that right in there. And that way I don't forget about that advantage against uh, being charmed and that if someone tries to put me to sleep, some other spellcaster tries to cast sleep on me, it's not going to work. And this next section is always an interesting part about playing elves, is the trance. You don't need to sleep. Um, you have to meditate for four hours a day. And while meditating, you, you do dream. Um, but the nice thing about this is you gain the benefits after four hours that a human or other characters or other races do after eight hours of sleep. So 
If you have a fighter who's an elf, he can do a lot of the nighttime guard. If you have a wizard that's an elf, once again, your wizard could do a lot of the, of the nighttime guard. Um, or could do other actions and activities while everybody else is generally sleeping. They could spend the time scribing their spell books and so forth that they might want to do if they come across a scroll or something. So it's kind of a really neat feature. Um, it might not jump right out and say this is a great in-game feature, but you can really take advantage of it at certain times. I probably would not put the trance feature on my character sheet um, because I've played elves enough to remember that. But if I was first playing it, you know, my first time playing, so, which is the focus of this video, I would go ahead and probably come on here and just go trance uh, four hours instead of eight hour long rest four hours meditation instead of eight hours long rest that'll be enough of a reminder to at least go back and check that rule when that situation comes up where i'm trying to rest and then finally languages i can speak and read and write common and elvish and it tells what El elvish is like which is more a little more flavor text but for the most part, the, what's important to me here is I can go over here to other proficiencies and languages and I will write common language, which is the language that everybody speaks pretty much. And then the elvish language, which is the language that's unique just to me being an elf. There are lots of sub races of uh, elves and other races as well. In this case, uh, the sub races of elves include, but aren't limited to, but definitely include high elves, wood elves, dark elves, or drow. There's also gray elves and gold elves and a bunch of other elves out there too. But the high elf and wood elf are probably the two that are going to be most encountered as player characters, although drow are definitely becoming more popular at the various gaming tables. For this character build, I'm choosing high elf. Uh, basically a high elf. I have a keen mastery of the basics of magic, which kind of makes it really nice and it flows right in with being a wizard. The neat thing about a high elf is you have your ability score increase, your intelligence score increases by one. So I'm going to go back over to the character sheet and just put a one there in the intelligence section so I don't forget that later. I have elf weapon training. I have proficiency with the long sword, short sword, short bow, and long bow. That's pretty big deal for an, a wizard. As most wizards don't get those things. They don't get the long sword or the short bow or the long bow. So I'm definitely going to come over here to my character sheet and put that down as a proficiency. And I would do that right kind of in the same area where I put my languages. The next feature that they get is a cantrip. So then these do not count towards your wizard spell list cantrip. So if you would, if you were like an elf fighter or an elf rogue, you could choose one cantrip and have that as your elf. Um, so you know the cantrip of your choice from the wizard spell list. Intelligence is your spell casting ability for it. So because of that, I know I'm going to have at least one additional cantrip. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to put in High Elf under Cantrip just so I remember that that's where that cantrip came from and I don't later on wonder why I have an extra cantrip and subtract it and you know, take a cantrip off of my list just because I forgot where it came from. So if I put this little tag there, High Elf, and I can remember that, oh, this was my High Elf cantrip, that's why I have an extra cantrip. And then finally, High Elf gives me an extra language. I can speak, read, and write one extra language of my choice, and I will go ahead and pick that out later. But for now, under languages, I'm just going to go add plus one extra language. And then I'll go pick that out, what that might be later on after I've developed the character a little bit more. All right, the next thing to take a look at is the class. And I know I'm going to be playing a wizard. A wizard is a scholarly magic user capable of manipulating the structures of reality. Um, the other classes that are available here in the basic rules are cleric, fighter, and rogue. Uh, and then here on page 22, it kind of outlines their highlights of each of those classes here. I see that my wizard, my hit die is going to be a D6. My primary ability is intelligence. 
by saving throw proficiencies are intelligence and wisdom. And finally, armor and weapon proficiencies. I can use daggers, darts, slings, quarterstaffs, and light crossbows, which is why that was really huge to get long swords and short swords and long bows and so forth from the elven class. So I'm going to go ahead back to my character sheet and put my hit dice on there. Once again, that's D6 or one six-sided dice. That's the dice that you would see in your Monopoly set or something like that. That's the normal dice, so to speak. So I have one of those, and it's a D6. So my, it's going to make my hit point maximum currently because you usually get your maximum hit dice on your first level. The next thing to add to my character sheet is a saving throw proficiency for intelligence and wisdom. So I'll come over here to saving throws on my character sheet for intelligence. I'll put a little dot there and wisdom. And now what that means is whatever my plus number is on the uh, ability score, I'll be able to add my proficiency bonus to that. So that'll be the number that goes into that box. And finally, from this section, I get a few more weapon proficiencies, and that would be the dagger, darts, slings, quarterstaffs, and light crossbow. So I'll just go ahead and just copy those and put those right underneath the other weapon proficiencies that I got from being an elf. Finally, what every wizard wants to know is what spells does he have? So I'm going here to the wizard section. I learned that for a first level wizard, my proficiency bonus is plus two. And you'll see that that will change at level five. My proficiency bonus will become plus three. And again, at level 9, it goes to plus 4. And again, at level 13, it'll become plus 5. And finally, at level 17, it'll max out at plus 6. I also have, for a class feature, I'll start out with spell casting and Arcane Recovery. We'll look at that here in a moment. And then for cantrips known, I'll have three cantrips plus my cantrip for being a high elf. So I'll actually have four cantrips. And then finally, I'll have two first level spells that I can cast out of my spell book. Going here to the spell casting uh, sheet, I'm going to, for my spell casting ability, that's going to be intelligence. And I'll be adding the, the actual bonus number in there as well. I know I'm going to have three more cantrips. I'll be able to cast two spells, two first level spells starting out. And obviously, I haven't cast any yet. And those uh, spells will, the spells total here will refresh at every long rest, which remember for this guy is four hours. You can only do one long rest a day, but he only takes him four hours to get those two spell slots back. For a hit point maximum, that's going to be six plus the constitution modifier. And I don't figure out that constitution modifier here in a little bit. Now we're looking here at the class features again, a little bit more detailed in this section. Uh, the hit dice is 1d6 per wizard level. Hit points is 6 plus your constitution modifier. And hit points at higher levels is you can either roll your six-sided dice or just take the average of four. And you also get to add your constitution modifier per wizard level after the first. So that means that at second level, you would add your constitution modifier again. At third level, you add it again. That doesn't mean that you get to add your entire constitution modifier multiplied by your wizard level. And at, at every level, it's just you're continuously adding your constitution modifier per wizard level. Um, where that really comes into play is if you improve your constitution score, and your constitution modifier increases, you can go ahead and put that all the way back to level one in that extra you know, mo modifier point that, that you would have gotten. Move, it's retroactive all the way back to level one. Once again, you're not proficient in any armor. So mage armor is pretty popular with wizards as a spell. Uh, weapons, you've got the daggers, darts, things, quarterstaffs, and light crossbows. You don't have any tools. Saving throws, intelligence, and wisdoms, and your skills. You can choose proficiency in two of these skills, Arcana, History, Insight, Investigation, Medicine, and Religion. Arcana is basically magic, so that's a pretty good, good one to take for your wizard. He probably should be pretty proficient in magic if he's 
makes his living with magic. So that's one of them I'm going to choose. And the other one that I like to choose a lot is investigation, uh, because you do do a lot of investigation while playing. Uh, sometimes history, to know the history of a region, that comes into play. Uh, insight can come into play if you want to know if someone's lying. Uh, to me, uh, medicine and religion, um, unless I was building him as a kind of some kind of a healing support or something like that, medicine's not going to have a real big impact. That's more for a druid or a cleric. And religion is definitely the uh, cleric's area. So for my characters, I like to do investigation as my other proficiency. I'll just come in here up a little tick right there so I remember to add the proficiency bonus to that when they get that far. Your character will also start with some equipment. Here I'm going to go ahead and add in the equipment that he starts with. I'm going to say he started with the, with the quarter staff. I could have chose quarter staff or dagger. So I'm going to go ahead and put quarter staff in the equipment section. He also gets to select a component pouch or an arcane focus. Frankly, an arcane focus is easier to play with. Well, a component pouch can be fun. You get to, you know, go find some bat guano or some fine pinch of sand or something like that. Or an arcane focus, you just, if as long as there's no actual cost to it, like a 500 gold piece gem or a diamond or something like that, if it's just some small insignificant thing, you could say you're just using an arcane focus, which helps you with your magic. Uh, pretty much just cuts down on the bookkeeping. So I'm just going to put arcane focus that and then he gets to pick either a scholar's pack or an explorer's pack. I would go ahead and pick an explorer's pack for him and we'll look at what's in an explorer's pack in a moment. And finally a spell book. Obviously he's a wizard he needs his spell book. You'll probably wish he had a backup spell book, even. All right, now we're really at the section where we need to determine our ability scores. We could have done this earlier. Uh, I just wanted to kind of go through the class and the race first and get that filled out before I went ahead and went back to determine my ability scores. But this is really before we start going into the spell casting part is where we need to figure out what we're going to have for each of those ability scores. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do ability scores. You can just use what's called the standard array, which is you can you put have a 15, a 14, a 13, a 12, a 10, and an 8. You can put onto your character sheet abilities in whatever order that you want. Or you could use the optional point buy system, where you have 27 points to spend on ability scores. Uh, the maximum of any one ability score is 15. Uh, and using the point buy system, you can have a a 15, 15, 15, 8, 8, 8, or more, maybe average 13, 13, 13, 12, 12, 12, or kind of any any other numbers. Um, so you can use the point by to kind of change what your character is going to be. Because this is a basic starting level character, we're just going to go ahead and use that basic standard array. And once again, the standard array is 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. Put in any order that you like. So I'm going to go over here to the character sheet, and because he's a spellcaster, um, intelligence is his primary ability, so that's where I'm going to put that 15, and I get to add that plus one, so that 15 plus one becomes 16, and then I'm going to go ahead and just erase that little note that I had for myself. So he's a 16 intelligence. The next number, uh, 14. I can kind of decide to put this in a couple of different places. Um, I can put it in under his, maybe his dexterity, or want to pump up his dexterity a little bit, or make it a little bit more wisdom or charisma. I want my wizard, though, to be a little bit more healthy, uh, just because wizards tend to be, they have that low hit dice, and if they get up to the front line at all, they can get hurt really quickly. So I'm just going to go ahead and make him a 14 constitution. I'll give him a few more hit points to uh, work with. My next number to consider here is the 13. And I'm going to go ahead and put that 13 under Charisma, because I want my wizard to be kind of likable. Obviously, this is a gameplay decision right here. 
Uh, you could put him under any of the uh, areas that you want. And I'm just going to go ahead and choose Charisma for my 13. Then I have left, I have a 12, 10, and an 8. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put the skip ahead to the 8 and put it under Dexterity because I'm getting that plus 2 from being an elf. So 8 plus 2 is 10. And that'll make my lowest number actually a 10, which is pretty good. And then that leaves me the 12 and the 10 from the standard array to put somewhere. I like to think my wizard's a little bit more wise than most, so I'm going to put that under Wisdom. And then finally give him an average strength of 10. So his strength and his dexterity are going to be average of 10 for both of those. And how I got to the 10 and Dexterity was by taking that 8 and adding that plus 2 from the Elvish uh, ability modifier, that racial trait. So that's how both of those became a 10, the strength of 10 from the standard array, and the Dexterity was 8 plus 2, and that plus 2 coming from the racial ability. Constitution, I wanted to be a little more healthy, so I gave him that 14. Intelligence, of course, that's his primary, so I wanted to get that as high as I possibly could, so I started with the 15, and the and plus 1 comes from being an elf again. And then Wisdom, he's got a 12, he's a little bit wiser than, than average. And Charisma, 13, he's a little bit more likable, a little bit more force of willpower than average. Now what we'll do is go ahead and turn those raw scores that I set up the strength of 10 and the dexterity of 10 and constitution of 14, intelligence of 16, wisdom of 12, and charisma of 13. Those will all get turned into ability score modifiers. And really it's the ability score modifier that you use most at the gaming table. The raw scores help you determine the modifier and the modifier is what you will use during play. It'll be really unusual to use a the actual raw score for anything during play. And as you can see here, the modifiers start with one and go all the way up to 30. Uh, it's very difficult to get a character, a player character beyond 20. Uh, there are a few ways to do it. Um, a barbarian can get themselves pumped up to a 23. Like in Tomb of Annihilation, there's a story reward that will move the character's dexterity to 23 if you uh, happen to get that particular story reward. But it's very, very rare to have a character beyond 20 for an ability score. So to determine which modifier to use, you just reference your ability score. In this case, my strength is 10. So I will look here and it shows that there's no modifier. I So 10 and 11 are considered average, considered typical, so I'm just going to go plus zero, and again for the dexterity, that's also a 10, so that's also going to be plus zero, that means if I roll a dice that has anything to do with strength or dexterity, I'm probably not going to add a modifier to it unless I also happen to be proficient in it. Um, constitution is a 14, so a 14, if I look over here, it's actually going to give me a plus two, I go over to here, I'll put plus two to my constitution. My intelligence, I have that 16 in there. So that'll give me a plus three, which is a good number to have there. So I'll put plus three under my intelligence. My wisdom was a 12. And the 12 is going to give me a plus one, plus one. And finally, Charisma is a 13, which is also going to give me a plus 1 because the range is 12 to 13. So I'll go ahead and put that plus 1 in there. And that's how you figure out what your ability scores and the corresponding modifiers are. Now that I know my ability scores and the corresponding modifiers, I can go ahead and finish filling out like my hit points. Because I had, as I had here, 6 plus the Constitution modifier. Finally, that's going to be 6 plus 2. So my hit points, I have eight hit points to start. Uh, my strength saving throw is going to match what it, uh, whatever it shows here because I do not have a proficiency in that. So I'll put zero for strength, zero for dexterity. For constitution, it's actually going to be plus two. Intelligence, it'll be plus three for 
the ability modifier and then plus two because I'm proficient in it. So that's actually going to be plus five if I have to do any kind of intelligence saving throw. Wisdom will be a plus one for the ability modifier and then a plus two for the proficiency bonus for a total of plus three. And for charisma, it's just going to be plus one because I can't add my proficiency bonus to that, so that will just be the plus one. The skills are filled out the same way we did the saving throws. You simply look at the ability that uh, corresponds to the skill, and then see if we're proficient or not. For example, acrobatics says it's dex-based or dexterity-based. I'm not proficient in it, so it's going to be whatever my raw dexterity score is. In this case, it's plus zero. Animal handling is wisdom based. I'm not proficient in it, but I do have a little bonus to my proficiency, so I'm going to give me a plus one to my animal handling. Arcana, uh, if I do any arcana checks, that's intelligence based and I'm proficient at it, so that gives me a plus three and a plus two. Athletics, I am pr not proficient at athletics. So and that, because that's strength-based, that becomes a zero. And I'm just going to go ahead and fill this out all the way down. Uh, investigation is intelligence-based, so I'll get to add my proficiency. Perception is wisdom-based, so I'll get to add my proficiency. The rest of the numbers are just going to match whatever my ability modifier says in the left-hand column. And as you can see here, I have went ahead and filled out the rest of those of columns there. Adding my proficiency once again into intelligence and wisdom, the investigation and perception, simply because I was proficient in it. If I had not been proficient in it, then I would not have been able to add that proficiency, which again is plus two. Now, when this proficiency bonus goes to plus three, I'll be able to add an additional one to each of these things I'm proficient at. So, intelligence saving and wisdom saving and arcana and investigation and Perception, anything else that I might become proficient at, will then be calculated at a plus three and not a plus two. And so you just go ahead and add those when you gain that appropriate level. And okay, so back to the spell casting piece of our wizard. Uh, spell casting is a sort of arcane magic. You have a spell book containing spells that show the first glimmering of your true power. And we'll go ahead and look at that spell cast list here in a moment. Uh, you have cantrip spells, which you can basically cast every action. You can cast a cantrip, and it does not take away from your spell casting slots. So, for example, Prestidigitation is a cantrip. And you could cast that every six seconds. You could just cast Prestidigitation. And what that does is lets you clean things or do some minor things like maybe start start a small fire or things like that. You could do that every six seconds, like light a candle, things like that. So if your wizard's walking through the murky swamp and all the other characters are getting all muddy and wet and dirty and tired and so forth, your wizard's just walking along just uh, clean as can be because he's constantly, every time he sees something, casting prestidigitation and cleaning that area. That can be kind of a fun role-playing piece where everybody else can be a bit grumpy and your wizard's like, what's the problem? I'm clean. But you also have a spell book. Uh, at first level, you have a spell book containing six first-level wizard spells of your choice, and we'll go pick those out. And then all of your spell books, or all of your spells, go into your spell book, except for your cantrips. You don't need to memorize cantrips. So even if your spell book is stolen from you, you still have your cantrips and you can always cast them. If your spell book is stolen from you, you have to try to get it back, or create a new spell book. That could take a long time, but you're still not left completely defenseless because you do have those cantrips. Now, to know how many spells that you can cast as a first level wizard, uh, you simply uh, choose a number of wizard spells from your spell book equal to your intelligence modifier plus your wizard level. So that's why it's so important to get that intelligence modifier as high as you can. In our case, if you remember, it was plus three, because our wizard level is only plus one. So if we had a zero to our intelligence or even a negative modifier, then that would really you know, take away from the number of spells that we could have available to cast. 
uh, a minimum you can have is one. So in our case, we could have our intelligence modifier of three plus one. So we could actually ca have four spells prepared. We only have two spell slots available, but we could have four spells from that we could choose to cast. So for example, we could have Mage Armor and Magic Missile and a couple of other first level spells in our minds ready to go, knowing we can only use two of them before the long rest. But at least we have options and we're not totally reliant upon, oh, I hope that this not situational dependent spell, I'm never going to learn it because I know I'm going to need Magic Missile, for example. On the character sheet, there's a space uh, for prepared, and you would just click the ones that you have prepared, and you can change your prepared ones after every long rest. And once we go ahead and pick out our spell book or our spells for our spell book, then we'll go ahead and click which ones might be prepared for this character. Before we pick out spells, we'll take a look at our spell save DC and our spell attack modifier. So our spell save DC is if the book or the spell calls for a target of your spell to make a save. They're going to make a save based upon the ability spelled out in the spell. And it could be dexterity, it could be constitution, it could be intelligence save. Um, and their DC, the number that they're going to have to hit, is going to be 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your intelligence modifier. Or in our case, that would be 8 plus 2 because our proficiency bonus is 2. And our current intelligence modifier is 3, so it would be 8 plus 2 is 10, plus 3 is 13, would be their spell save DC that they would have to hit. So we'll just go ahead and put a 13 on the spell casting sheet under spell save DC. And of course, when you increase your intelligence modifier, or your proficiency bonus, then this number also goes up. So don't forget to also add to these um, to your spell save DC when either your proficiency bonus or your intelligence modifier increases. And then you have your spell attack modifier. Any roll that calls for an attack roll, you get to add this to it. And that'll simply be your proficiency bonus plus your intelligence modifier. So two plus three is five. You don't get to use that eight. It's just your proficiency bonus and your intelligence modifier, and that would be plus five for your uh, any spell that requires an attack roll. And this is similar to the fighter's attack bonus when he swings his sword. He gets to add his strength bonus plus his proficiency bonus. It's the same thing here for the wizard. Any attack roll, you get to add your intelligence bonus plus your proficiency bonus. Now there's another type of spell. It's called a ritual spell, and if the spell has a ritual tag on it, which you know it's, it'll t tell you when the spell if it can be cast as a ritual or not. Uh, Find familiar, for example, is a ritual spell. Invisible servant is, an, is a ritual spell. You can cast those without; they're not cantrips, but you can cast them without using a spell slot. The downside is that it does take ten minutes to cast them. Now you can cast them using your spell slot, but that's in most cases going to be a waste of your spell slot. So you would just want to take those 10 minutes and cast anything with a ritual tag without using a spell slot. And that might be something you do first thing in the morning. That might be something as a high elf you might do in the middle of the night when everybody else is sleeping. You might get your familiar to come to you. You might get your invisible servant ready to go so the next day you don't have to do a lot of menial labor like putting your tent away and so forth. And then you also have your spell casting focus. You could use the arcane focus as a spell casting focus for your wizard spells. And then finally, when you gain second level, third level, fourth level, every time you gain a wizard level, you get two free wizard spells of your choice uh, that you can add from the player's handbook or from any other official type source um, that you can just go ahead and put right onto your spell sheet or onto your into your spell book. The other feature that you get at first level is Arcane Recovery. Now this is pretty nice because once per day after a short rest, you can go ahead and recover some spell slots. 
Uh, the spell slots can have a combined level that is equal to or less than half your wizard level rounded up. So at first level, you can recover one of your spell slots one time a day. So you can start the day with two spell slots. Let's say you cast spells, you use one or both of them. You take your short rest, which is a one hour rest. You stop to have lunch, kind of rest up and do some wound healers or something like that. Spend some hit dice. And at the same time, you can recover at first level one of those spell slots. And at second level, one of those spell slots. All right, and we're finally ready to select our wizard spells. Now remember, we get one wizard spell for being an high elf. And then we get some additional wizard spells for being a wizard. So we'll have four total cantrips. And then we'll also get six first level spells that we can put into our spell book, of which we'll be able to have four of those prepared. So for the cantrips, I'm going to go ahead and first choose Mage Hand. So I'll just take and go ahead and copy Mage Hand. I'm going to put that right under my High Elf skill. That was what he got for the skill that he is because he is a High Elf. And it doesn't really matter how you put these. Like I said before, I have this high elf tag in here just so I remember why I have four cantrips when a wizard would normally just have the three. The next one that I want is Prestidigitation, and I'm going to go ahead and put that into my spell book. And then I'm going to need to do some attacking probably. So I'm going to want Firebolt. That's always a nice one to have. It lets you do a basically a ranged attack with your spells. You don't need to worry about bows and arrows or anything like that. I'm going to go ahead and choose Dancing Lights, uh, just because it's something that you don't maybe see a lot. It's got a lot of, ut of utility for it. So the four of them that I'm going to choose are Mage Hand, Prestidigitation, Firebolt, and Dancing Lights. Now if I look at Mage Hand, that's a Conjuration cantrip. It costs one action to cast. It's 30 feet. And the nice thing about that is basically it's a hand that just reaches out around the spot and you can go ahead and start picking up and moving things, manipulating things 30 feet away from you. So you can use it to open an unlocked door. You can't do a pick lock, but if the door is unlocked, it can open it. It can open up a container. It can grab an item from an open container. Uh, so once it's opened the container, the next round, it could actually grab that, grab the item from it, pour out something. Uh, you can move it around. Uh, you can move it 30 feet every as um, as you use it. And then finally, it can't attack or it cannot activate magic. And it is weight limited to just 10 pounds. But it's a great utility type spell as far as standing back, opening that door. That way when the trap goes off that was around the door, uh, it doesn't really hurt anybody because you were standing 30 feet away maybe even around the corner with lots of cover. So Prestidigitation is the second cantrip that I chose. That's the Transmutation cantrip. And that's the one that I was discussing earlier where the wizard's walking through the swampy ground and he's perfectly clean while everybody else is all muddy and sweaty and covered in all kinds of foul yuck simply because he can just walk along and keep himself clean. Other uses for the spell include creating an instantaneous, harmless sensory effect, showers of sparks, puff of wind, musical notes, odors. Uh, you can put out a candle, torch, or small campfire instantly. Uh, so you can light it or put it out. Um, you can instantly clean or make dirty an object no larger than one cubic foot. So that's where that's, that swamp walk comes in. You can chill, warm, or flavor a cubic foot of non-living material for an hour, so he never has to eat cold food. He can always warm up his food to his or chill his food to his preferred temperature. You can make a color, a small mark, or a symbol appear on an object or surface for an hour. So if the wizard or the party gets a little bit separated, he can go ahead and leave marks so somebody else can follow him. And then finally, you can create a non-magical trinket or illusionary image that can fit in your hand and last until the end of your next turn. So that can be kind of helpful sometimes if you're trying to show somebody that you have something that you might not actually have. Uh, you create an illusion of it, and they see it, and maybe they believe you. 
and of course it disappears rather quickly so that hopefully they believe you quickly and you don't need to keep showing it to them. Uh, if you cast the spell multiple times, you can have up to three of its non-instantaneous effects active at a time, and you can dismiss such an effect as an action. The third cantrip I selected was Firebolt. That's an evocation cantrip. It takes an action to cast. And basically, you're just hurling fire at a target. That's where I say it's, a, it's your ranged attack. It's a 120-foot ranged attack. It's as good as any bow. It does 1d10 fire damage. Once again, as good as any bow. And a flammable object hit by this uh, spell ignites if it isn't being worn or carried. So that can be helpful at times too. And this, the nice thing about this spell is as your level increases at 5th level, the damage of it goes to 2d10. At 11th level, you get to roll 3 10-sided dice. And finally, at 17th level, you're rolling 4 10-sided dice just for throwing out this simple cantrip. And the last cantrip I chose was the Dancing Lights cantrip. That is a range of 120 feet. Now, it is a concentration spell, which means that you can't cast other spells that require concentration while you're concentrating on this spell. And if you take damage, you can actually lose the spell because you have to do a constitution save. Uh, which you can create up to four torch-sized lights within range. Uh, they can look like torches, lanterns, or glowing orbs. Or you could combine them so they look kind of humanoid. Um, and each of the lights will shed 10 foot radius dim light. So this can be helpful if you have party members who don't have um, dark vision and nobody has a light spell and nobody has a torch. But it's not going to replace a light spell or a torch. Uh, the nice thing about this though is that you can use it to kind of fool your enemies because the range of casting it is 120 feet. So you could cast it on the other side of a room or way down a corridor if you're being chased and make you, someone chasing you think that that it must be you going that way person you guys are actually hiding in a different direction so dancing lights can actually be rather helpful at times in various situations the other thing that's nice about dancing lights unlike an actual light spell or a torch or something like that is you can move it around as long as it's within range of you so you can move it 60 feet so let's say you're trying to see something more see or see something that more illuminated out on the battlefield or if you're trying to see something with your dark vision uh, remember you can only see in shades of gray you get the dancing lights over there now all of a sudden you can see in color and you can see you know the color of the tunics that your enemy is wearing or which statue is blue and which statue is red um, and, and or any other thing where you where a color kind of becomes more important to get that dancing light out there as a cantrip and actually take a look at things a little bit more carefully. Whereas with a light spell, maybe you try to throw a coin or a rock that you've cast light on or a torch, you try to toss a torch, but those things are a limited, little bit more limited and you can't move them around yourself. So Dancing Lights definitely has a good utility, especially if you already have dark vision and don't actually need a separate light spell. Now for our six spells to put into our spell book, the first thing I like to always choose is Magic Missile. Now that's a nice, little bit more beefier than Firebolt. It's a missile that almost always hits. Uh, if the target has a shield spell, basically, it won't, or a counter spell, it might not hit. But pretty much, Magic Missile always hits. That's a really nice go to uh, spell. Shield is always a nice go to spell, especially as a wizard, because your armor class is not going to be that great. But with the shield spell, you can go ahead and give yourself a temporary boost to armor class, at least, at the expense of one of your spell slots. Uh, something else that's nice along that same idea is Mage Armor, which lasts for eight hours. That's a little bit better use, but if you do need that, you know, Mage Armor will get you so far, and the shield will get you even further. So it's nice to have any, actually have those and use them in combination. Another spell that I like as a first level wizard is Detect Magic. Because if you can't detect magic as the wizard, then why are you a wizard? I guess is my theory. Comprehend Languages is always nice. That way it doesn't really matter that you don't know the language. You can cast the spell and at least understand it. And then finally, we have our sixth spell, which 
it kind of becomes a little bit uh, what is interesting to you as a player. I do like identify, but uh, something like silent image it can definitely be useful as well. Or an area of effect spell like sleep can come in really handy. It kind of depends upon the campaign and what you're playing and what your other party member composition might be. Because if you know you have someone who's another wizard in the party who's heavy with area of effect spells, you might want to focus more on the utility type spells. Um, but if you don't, you know, sleep would be a definitely a contender too between identify and sleep. And remember, at second level, you will pick up some more spells, but chances are you're going to want them to be second level spells, at least to start with. So it might sound like you're going to get more, but really at this point, I per personally, I would prefer I'd identify because sleep does not really grow, grow with you, and identify is always useful to have all the way up to level 20. So I'm just going to go ahead and put identify in there, although I probably would never be a memorized spell. Now once again, magic missile is that first level evocation spell. It's instantaneous. It means you just point your three fingers at the target or a finger at a target, and you get three glowing darts of magical force comes firing away from you. And then they instantly hit. You don't have to do an attack roll. You don't have to do any kind of uh, overcome any kind of resistances. They just hit. Uh, the only defense really is the shield spell, um, is the only real defense or counter spell, something like that. But uh, they are pretty vicious and they do always hit, which is what makes them so nice. Each of those three darts does 1d4 plus 1 of damage, so you can target all of them against one creature or one target. Or you can target two against one target and one against a, a second target. You can actually send one to three different targets. It's kind of, you know, it really depends upon who you're facing and kind of how tough you think that they might be, whether you could actually take them all out with uh, three different targets or three, you know, three your three different darts, or if you kind of need to focus all those darts onto one. The darts all do strike at the same time, so you can't, you know, hit one and then change over to another target. You have to declare where all three are going because all three will hit at the same time. And if you do cast this using a second level spell slot or a higher level spell slot, then you get additional darts for each spell slot above first. So at 20th level, you could send out 23 of these darts, which are almost guaranteed to hit every time. Now the shield spell is a first level abjuration spell. It takes a reaction. So you would not cast this as a target or during your actual action, you would cast this if you were being targeted. Um, if someone was attacking you, shooting an arrow at you, hitting you with a sword, or targeting you with the magic missile spell. You cast this on yourself, only you can't cast this on a friend. But it's an invisible barrier of magic force appears and protects you until the start of your next turn. You have plus five bonus to your armor class, including against the triggering attack, and you take no damage from magic missile. So if a fighter runs up at you and all of a sudden swings at you and you weren't able to get out of, uh, of the way at your time, even though it's his turn, you can use what's called a reaction, spend a spell slot, give yourself plus five bonus to AC, and hopefully he won't hit you then. Or if an enemy wizard fires their magic missiles at you, you just throw up your shield, and the magic missiles do no harm. Mage Armor, it's a first level abjuration spell. It takes an action to cast. It does not require concentration, and it lasts eight hours. It's like the druids have what's called the Barkskin spell, which is pretty nice. But that one's actually a concentration spell. Uh, Mage Armor is not, which makes it a really handy spell to have for almost all classes really um, if you're if they were able to class to if they were able to actually cast a wizard spell and you can do that with certain feats and so forth uh, so ba so you touch a willing creature who is not wearing armor so you can't already have armor on and stack this onto armor it does not stack but you get a protective magical force surrounds the target until the spell ends and you can cast it on yourself or you can cast it on an ally, or maybe an NPC who you're trying to defend. Uh, you can cast it on anybody that you want. 
The target's base armor class becomes 13, plus its dexterity modifier. And then the spell ends if the target puts armor on, or if you just dismiss the spell, but that does take an action to turn the spell off. So for our elf character, for example, if he were to cast this spell, Mage Armor, it would, his armor class would just become 13. Currently, because he's not wearing any armor and his dexterity is 0, his armor class is 10. But casting Mage Armor would actually make it 13. So in armor class, I might go something like this, 10, and then do a slash, and 13. That way I can remember that usually he's 10, but if he has Mage Armor going, then that's 13. Um, and I can probably remember if I have Mage Armor cast or not. If not, I could make another note there or something. Detect Magic is a first level divination spell. It requires an action. You have to cast it on yourself. Um, and then for the duration of 10 minutes, uh, you can sense the presence of magic within 30 feet of you. Now this spell does require concentration too. Uh, if you sense magic in this way, you can use your action to see a faint aura around any visible creature or object in the area that bears magic, and you learn the school of magic, if any. Uh, the spell can penetrate most barriers, but is blocked by a foot of stone, an inch of common metal, a thin sheet of lead, or three feet of wood or dirt. This can be handy if maybe you're facing off against an enemy and you want to figure out who has the magic weapon or you're trying to find a magic item and it's in a room and you're in a pile of stuff and you're just trying to find the magic item. So that's kind of a very versatile spell. Now comprehend languages, and this is a ritual spell. So this is another spell I probably would never have prepared um, in my spell book because I know I can always just take 10 minutes and cast it at the first level divination spell. Uh, to actually cast it using a Spell slot would take one action. To cast it as a ritual takes 10 minutes. Uh, you cast it on yourself. It lasts for an hour. It does not require a concentration. And for the duration of the spell, you understand the literal meaning of any spoken language that you hear. So if they're talking in some kind of slang, you might not make much sense to you um, because it's the literal meaning. You also understand written language that you see, but you must be touching the surface on which the words are written. Um, so as long as you are able to hold the letter or touch the plaque or somehow make contact with that object, then you can go ahead and read it. It takes about one minute to read one page of text. This spell does not decode secret messages in the text or a glyph, such as an arcane sigil. Uh, that is not part of the written language. So that would be a limitation. So what I would probably do is write down each of my spells on an index card or a piece of paper and just write down at least the highlights, the notes that I would need. That way I would have them at the gaming table because nothing is more annoying than the player who, who is playing the wizard constantly flipping through the player's handbook, looking up their spells. It's much nicer just to write those down on a index card or type up a, a Word document and then print that out so that you have that right there for a quick reference. If you forgot to add something to it, then you can grab out the player's handbook and look up that piece that you forgot. But you probably would then want to add that piece so that next time you would have that. So finally, I get to pick out which spells I have prepared. And like I said, when I was uh, describing the spells, the comprehend languages and the identifier, are both ritual spells, so I would probably not want those prepared or picking up a prepared slot. So for now, I would choose the Detect Magic, the Mage Armor, the Shield, and the Magic Missile as being the spells that I have prepared. Now, as I gain more spells, I might find scrolls or other wizards that lets me copy spells from their spell books, and I would then be able to add those into my spell book. Then I might change my list of prepared spells, but to start out, I would start with these prepared spells. Another fun ritual spell, like I was saying, to try to get right away is that Find Familiar spell. And like the Invisible Servant spell, they're both really handy spells to have as wizards, and they're both ritual spells. So really at this point, your base character is pretty much figured out as far as the game statistics. But what you don't have yet is what he, who he really is, what he looks like, or what she looks like. 
Um, and what you can do to add to that is go into the document that you downloaded from the uh, D the D and D basic rules document, and you can find the random height and weight table, and then you can figure out your height and your weight for your character. Um, he starts out, for example, our high elf would start out at four feet six inches to our base height. And then we would roll two 10-sided dice and add that many inches to it. So for example, if we were to roll, say, a five and a seven, that would be 12 inches or one additional foot. That would give us five feet, six inches, which we could then go on to the third, the character details piece of the character sheet. And we could put uh, five feet, six inches. And then his base weight would be 90 pounds, and then we would multiply that times a 1d4. So we would just roll a 1d4 or pick a number between 1 and 4 and multiply that to 90. I'm just going to say 2. So 90 times 2 is 180, so that makes him 180 pounds. So maybe a little bit on the heavier side, but not, not, not too bad at all. Um, eyes and other physical characteristics like that, you just go ahead and pick. Um, so as it says here, you might want to add an unusual or memorable physical physical characteristic, a scar, a limp, or a tattoo. Now we discussed alignment a little bit earlier when I said he was going to be chaotic good. Uh, the book does actually detail lawful good, neutral good, chaotic good, lawful neutral, neutral, chaotic neutral, lawful evil, neutral evil, and chaotic evil. Uh, for most campaigns, this doesn't really come into play too much. But it can help you kind of role play your character and make the decisions that his that he would do. So for example, with uh, our elf um, creatures as chaotic good, he would act as their conscious directs, but little regard for what others expect. So copper dragons, elves, and unicorns are all chaotic good. So they're going to go with what feels right, what they think is right not maybe what others would expect them to do. You can also pick out in an additional language. For example, with our high elf here, he gets an additional language. So you could pick any language out of the standard language or even the exotic language uh, sections if you want. Um, some DMs might ask, how did your character come to know uh, celestial or deep speech? And if you have a good enough backstory, usually they're happy with it. Uh, maybe you know Draconic because there's a group of dragonborn who live nearby and you visit them often. So that's how you learn Draconic. Otherwise, if you just pick uh, one of the other languages, uh, giant, gnomish, goblin, halfling, orc, uh, those are pretty common languages that are spoken by lots of different groups. And it would not be unusual for your character to speak it. For in addition to common and elvish, I'm just going to go ahead and say that our half-elf speaks giant for some reason. Perhaps there was some giants that lived nearby. So I'm going to go ahead and take out that plus one extra language and change that into giantish. Because for some reason, he knows some ogres or giants and happens to speak their language. The next thing we should pick out for our character is his background. Now, there are several backgrounds. There's a few here in the basic rules book. There's more in the player's handbook and some of the other rules book actually have even more and more backgrounds. And you can even de de develop your own custom background. Um, from, a play from a game perspective, the background gives you additional skill proficiencies, some tool proficiencies, equipment, and they also help you to define how you became who you are. Uh, for example, with the full hero background, uh, that would give our our elf animal handling and survival. Now, because he already has animal handling from another source, you could go back and ch choose one of the other options instead of animal handling from that source. And I would definitely uh, recommend doing that. Uh, what we will get to do here is add survival. And because we've now checked or clicked that button by survival, that means we can add our proficiency bonus of plus two to it. So instead of being plus one, now our survival becomes the plus one for wisdom and then the plus two for the proficiency bonus or plus three, which is always nice to have for survival. The tool proficiencies, uh, he did not have any tool proficiencies for being a wizard, but now he gets one type of artisan's tools and land vehicles. 
So we would come down underneath our proficiencies and languages, and we're going to add land vehicles and artisans tools, which we would then need to go pick those out later too. And then finally, equipment. He gets a set of those artisan's tools. He gets a shovel, an iron pot, a set of common clothes, a pouch, and 10 gold pieces. For now, we're just going to come in here for his equipment and put add the artisan's tools. He also received a shovel, a pot, common clothes. A pouch, and in that pouch is 10 gold pieces. I like to list that pouch on there because sometimes if you lose your backpack, your explorer's pack, you still have a pouch to put things in. It might be a small pouch just made for coin, but at least you have something to stick, stick things in. And then you get to pick out your defining event. Uh, you previously pursued a simple prof profession among the peasantry. Perhaps you were a farmer, miner, servant, shepherd, woodcutter, or gravedinger. But something happened that set you on a different path. Okay, because and I'm saying he's a folk hero, which isn't super common for a wizard. So what would be that I could roll a d10 and pick one of these 10? Or I can look at them and say, which one? would make the most sense for my guy here. I know he's chaotic good, so he's not going to do what's expected. So let's say that uh, a lord rescinded an unpopular decree after I led a symbolic act of protest against it. So that was my defining act. Or maybe a celestial fay or similar creature gave me a blessing or revealed my secret origin. That could have been my defining act. But I kind of like this Lord rescinded an unpopular decree after I had let a symbol, uh, a symbolic act of protest against it, because that gives my character some backstory and maybe some tie-ins even for the campaign. So what I would do with that is I would come right into here, and that's going to be my defining event. There really isn't a specific spot for your defining event on your character sheet anywhere. But you can go ahead and put that wherever you want. You can start there your character's backstory. That's where I would go ahead and put that. So right there, your character's backstory on the character de detail sheet. And that's a Lord rescinded on popular decree after I let a symbolic act of protest against it. And that's when I kind of stopped being the apprentice to my master. And maybe the master, the Lord did something to my master even. And that could be some really some interesting backstory Kick, uh, plot tie-ins with this that you could really help work out with the help of your dungeon master and your dungeon master might uh, start adding those into the campaign a little bit too to make everything kind of flow together nicely. The next things to pick out are your personality traits, your ideals, your bonds, and your flaws. And those are going to come from your backstory, from your uh, background. And so once again, you can roll if you just can't decide one and you just want to roll something. Or you can actually pick one out. Now I like this one here. I'm confident in my own abilities and do what I can to instill confidence in others. I mean, as the wizard, he's very confident. He can control all these powers. But he's not completely arrogant. He actually, you know, tries to help others get their um, abilities raised as well. So I'm going to put that under my personality traits. And for my ideal... Uh, with that backstory that's maybe forming, maybe he doesn't like tyrants. Tyrants must not be allowed to oppress the people, he says. He believes in freedom. So that would be his ideal, and it, that would also be the chaotic. Uh, his bond. Maybe now for his bond and that backstory that we're kind of forming that goes along with that ideal, perhaps he may have already had an encounter with that lord. Uh, proud noble once gave me a horrible beating and i will take my revenge on any bully i encounter that could be a bond or he could simply say i protect those who cannot protect themselves and i think that's more of what he would be like the other one would be good but i think it's be for this character i protect those who cannot protect themselves would be his true bond because otherwise 
he would just move on from the area and probably would have not have done or performed that symbolic uh, action that uh, the Lord has since recently overturned. And finally, everyone he has a flaw. And finally, his flaw. Now, his flaw, he probably doesn't see this as, as a flaw. He sees this as a positive, and I'm going to say secretly, he believes things would be better if he were the Lord lording over the land, or he were the tyrant. Of course, he would never call himself the tyrant. He thinks the current Lord is the tyrant, and that he should be in charge. Remember, he's a high elf, so perhaps he has got some nobility in his background somewhere, or for some reason he thinks that if he were in charge, things would be better. So go ahead and put that under his flaw, that that's really what he thinks. But probably nothing that he maybe shares with others, or if he does, he shares it in such a way that it doesn't sound bad, like he was going to, you know, become an evil tyrant as well. Now on our character sheet, in the equipment section, we had wrote Explorer's Pack, because that is what had been called out. Uh, in the document, you can find that Explorer's Pack is a backpack, a bedroll, a mess kit, a tinder box, 10 torches, 10 days of rations and a water skin, and 50 feet of hemp and rope strapped to the side of it. So instead of just having the words Explorer's Pack here under Equipment, I would go ahead and just erase that and then put in each of the individual items that were called out in that Explorer's Pack. That way, as I use my rations or if I use the rope, um, then I don't have to... It's just easier to keep track of it if I have it actually all spelled out on there. So go ahead and put just my 50 feet of rope, water skin, rations, and torches. Mess kit and tinderbox, backpack and bedroll. So the final thing I'm going to do here is actually put add his spell casting attacks on here, and he really only has the one, which is firebolt, which is going to be that ranged attack, and it's going to be fire. And I'm going to say it's 120 foot range, and your attack bonus is going to be a spell casting ability or a spell casting uh, attack bonus with plus five. And so that's where that would go is right there, plus five for the attack bonus. You could add magic missile on here. You could add his short bow on here. You could add his long sword on here. Say so he also likes to pull that long sword out sometimes because he's proficient as an elf. He can actually use that long sword. Uh, but his, his attack bonus is actually only going to be zero plus two. It's only going to be a plus two. And then the damage for a long sword is going to be a, and the damage for that long sword is going to be that 1d8 slashing, or if you use it two handed or versatile, then you can get 1d10. But uh, for him, it's going to get 1d8 slashing. So that would be where this would go 1d8, and the type would be slashing. And I forgot to add up here that it's a 1d10 fire for the damage type for the fire bolt. It's 1d10 fire. I could also add the longbow in here. Um, once again, his dexterity is zero, so the only, only proficiency being added would be the plus two. Um, he would not, for example, add his strength bonus here. He could add his strength bonus, but it's just going to be plus zero because his strength modifier is plus zero. So generally speaking, he's not going to use his longsword, but he could. It's an option for him. The other nice thing is, is he has... Um, is he does have these weapons that he can pick up and use should he, should he choose to, should he need to. But for the most part, he's probably going to rely on Firebolt, and he's never want to get toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody because our Firebolt being a ranged weapon, he would suddenly be at disadvantage. That's when he might pull out his sword, and if he needed to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, but he could probably choose to disengage and try to back off behind the fighters and then send some Firebolts as soon as he could. And then just Taking a final glance here at our character sheet, I did add the folk hero under background. Initiative is going to be whatever your dexterity modifier is, unless you have some kind of a feat or ability that lets you have a, another bonus to it. But generally, it's the same as the dexterity. In this case, it would be zero. Our current hit points is going to be the same as our maximum hit points, because we haven't lost any yet. We don't have any, don't have any temporary currently. Don't have any death saves or successes yet. Haven't yet earned any inspiration through role-playing. 
But for the most part, our character sheet's ready to go. We know what equipment we have. We know something about our character. We know what game features he has. We know his spells. And we have some idea about his backstory and a little bit about what he looks like. Obviously, we need to finish filling in his eye color, his skin color, things like that in, into there. So I hope you have enjoyed and have learned how to create a wizard character. This is a basic wizard character. And over time, you would be able to then, as you play him, you'll level up, you'll gain more and more abilities. And I really hope you enjoy playing this character. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to share, like, subscribe, hit that bell icon. Enjoy. See you next time.